Okay. Welcome, everybody, to ARCI's virtual forum number 21. I'm Tom Zaychek, your moderator for today, and I'm pleased to be here and tell you we've got a great uh, agenda for you guys today. And uh, it's it's been a while. It's been since May. And, uh, you know, we used to call this something else besides the virtual forum. We changed the name a while back. And if I had a photographic memory, I could tell you when we changed that. But my photographic memory doesn't work anymore because I can't get any film for it. You know how that works. And uh, we have one more virtual forum uh, this year, November 19th. And right now for 2023, we have some proposed dates, as you can see there. And um, we also would like to have your feedback at any time at that email address, if you have any comments or questions or ideas. And as always, I, I implore you guys to put together a presentation or just do a simple show and tell for these meetings. It, it really makes, uh, makes this whole thing work, people volunteering. And, uh, and I'll say that uh, I'm really pleased that today we have three presenters that haven't presented before. So this is a, this is another first, and I can't remember when we had that. That's my photographic memory again, but it was right at the beginning we had three presenters that hadn't presented. So it's been like 21 issues of this program that uh, we've gone by, and we have three presenters who are uh, first timers. So the uh, protocol here is pretty simple. Please stay on mute. Um, the presenters have worked it out ahead of time how much time they are going to use up. And um, if you have a question, just unmute, ask it, go back on mute when you're done. And that, that keeps us nice and quiet. And if you have any questions, you can use the chat window. Uh, Zoom has a great chat feature. So please use that. And uh, a, a very important note is we record these and put these on YouTube, on our YouTube channel. And Matt will have a few things to say about that right now. Just a few tips on YouTube. Remember that everything you show or share will be viewable to anyone who watches uh, our YouTube channel. And uh, right now it's, well, it can't, obviously can't guarantee it, but we have something like 100 subscribers, which my children just laugh at and mock me whenever I mention that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, compared to the thousands that, uh, or hundreds of thousands of the channels that they follow. Anyway, um, so as most of us know, YouTube is very uh, careful about not violating other people's copyrighted materials. So one of the main things they do is it looks for or listens for copyrighted music. So as you're doing a band scan of your newly restored radio, uh, and you're going to stop on a station, please stop on a talk station, not a music, music station. Otherwise, we'll get a copyright strike. As Tom mentioned earlier, we use the chat feature. It's a great place to put contact details, things that you don't want to be viewable on YouTube. And um, follow Tom's lead when we're running this. Stay on mute, as he's suggesting. and. He will open the floor up for questions, uh, time permitting. And so he's watching the clock. Uh, with that, I'll turn it back over to Tom. Okay, well, here's our agenda for today. And uh, you can see that we've got three uh, presentations lined up. And after we do those presentations, we do show and tells. And we're gonna put up a poll here pretty quick about whether you have a show and tell, that just helps us budget our time. And um, after we do the show and tell session, then we'll just talk a little bit about our, our swap meet, when the next one is, and then we have an items wanted, items for sale. And once we conclude that, we open it up for uh, just a, a chat session. So if anybody wants to hang around and talk about Anything kind of related to what we do here, that's the time to do it. So um, with that being said, I'll uh, 
introduce our first presenter, Bill Goodwin. Uh, I've been emailing with Bill for a few months on and off, and he has a very fascinating presentation on, uh, on a very early radio company from Philadelphia and uh, the uh, FB Chambers company. And uh, Bill has uh, really done extensive research here. Bill is from uh, uh, the Mark Radio Club, he's back east, and he's graciously uh, agreed to uh, present his presentation today. So uh, with that being said, I will now turn it over to Bill, and we'll hear about this early radio company. This is a slightly modified program and will be more rushed from what I presented at the Mark radio activity in June. I think Robert, you had seen it there. Um, part of the reason for doing it was um, I wanted to get the information out there about this company because the people were fascinating to me. So let me launch into the program. Uh, like many of you, I think, uh, when we come across something that strikes us, we want to get into it a little bit more. And in getting into this family's uh, history, um, it became more and more intriguing as I got into it. But um, for me, as with many of you, um, I grew up with it, not quite as early as the chambers from the late 1800s, but um, from childhood, blowing fuses, getting semi-electrocuted, um, but radio was a fascination, even to the point that when bringing some equipment back from Australia uh, for the first time going through customs, it got so tongue-tied that the customs agent in Hawaii looked at me very sternly and said, I know you. And I started getting nervous butterflies. He said, you were the guy as a kid who strung a wire from your bedroom window to the nearest tree. And it was certainly true, and it broke the ice and told me that uh, this particular behavior was fairly typical of boys of my era. So with this particular uh, journey, um, just hunting for things generally brought me across one of the FB Chambers pieces of equipment. It was in a field auction. And then at that time, the auctioneer went around in a golf cart, and his helper would uh, either point out, hold, or put his foot on whatever item was being auctioned because there was thousands of items in a big, long, multi-line field. And so as I got it, I let it lay for a while, and then I started looking and found that um, the story of the people came out, but we'll get into that in a moment. With this company, their development started around 1904 or five, and went into the 40s. And the uh, principals, especially at B Chambers, moved the amateur radio industry forward by affecting legislation, which changed from point to point only communications to what we know as broadcasting. And it involved a loving partnership with his wife, involvement with his brother, and an apparent family tragedy. So he was born in uh, 1879 in Norristown, PA, as the eldest of six. And on the second line, it says uh, S, then lineman, electrical engineer. Uh, that was his brother. And uh, this, another son, his late, youngest son, was a carpenter. His father was a laborer, then carpenter with his own shop. And that, to my mind, is a bit significant. And maybe I'll remember to bring it up a little later. He got married in 1905. Uh, put this abbreviated family tree up there because uh, just to give you a little visual of them, and both uh, Barclay and Frank's wives were considerably older than they were. And I'm not sure if there's anything to be made of that, but it just struck me. And they did have a son who was uh, born in uh, 1906 and um, may have died before 1920 because he disappears from the records of the Census Bureau. Hester Rulon Erickson was born in New Jersey in 1869, second of five children, second daughter. 
and was a dressmaker. In the family history, the men were laborers, women were homemakers, but the family lore says that they had an ancestor, John Erickson, who some will remember designed the monitor in the, for the Civil War and developed the screw propeller and many other naval uh, inventions. And so famous was he that there's a monument to him in Washington, DC. So whether or not he was in the family, it struck me that with uh, Hester's emerging involvement in the company that the family lore may have helped spark her involvement. And to give a, a little um, overview of what was going on in the development, the upper slide shows wireless development and a couple of key points in it. And then communications use. And then green, Frank and Hester's birth and marriage. And then they began their work in 1905. And you can see how all these timelines overlap. So why did they get involved? Why did anybody get in? involved in long waves. Well, um, man-made lightning is a term most often given to spark transmission. And of course, is the first source of recognized electromagnetic waves, at least to my knowledge. And Fezzedin in a number of points notes that the receiver development was critical to development. Um, maybe a slight parallel, it said uh, battery development in the first battery cars became so pronounced that that's what proved uh, the demise of them because they found that they could get a good battery that would turn over a gasoline engine to get it started. So Fezzedin was saying, unless you could have good receivers, you weren't gonna get good communications. But then he was also very heavily involved in Spark Gap with the patents as mentioned, and even talked as early as 1898 about tank circuits versus open tuned circuits. And the radio spectrum as used then, um, especially at the bottom, you see trans-oceanic stations were very low frequency, very high wavelengths. And uh, a lot of what uh, Chambers did was um, beginning with the very earliest. He had one loose coupler, for example, that uh, I mentioned is was three feet long to catch those uh, low frequency, high wavelengths. So his personal history is given by him to Congress as he was electrical engineer with broad training and a radio engineer. That's a quote attributed to him in the congressional record. He was involved in telegraph, telephone, electrical lighting and overhead steel railway companies and held various positions. But their um, courtship and partnership um, mentions that they, he first saw her at a Masonic ball. And my guess is they were uh, lifelong Masons as will come up um, at the very end. And just seeing Hester from behind, he wanted to uh, meet her, which strikes me as particularly strong inducement. Uh, if a back of somebody looks good, why not the front? Um, so they got married in February and immediately uh, took up residence in Philadelphia. Her comment in 1910 was that he was such an enthusiast of the most intense kind, but that he would not enjoy it unless she was involved too. In a 1916 article, they were called Mr. and Mrs. N.R. And you longtime hands would recall that the earliest licensees for wireless work could choose their own call sign within limits. And he chose NR because he was uh, from Norristown, Pennsylvania. And he also agreed with her that he wouldn't have done it without her. And he credited her. And this is where I get the strongest uh, uh, con con uh, commendation was Manufacturing their instruments was uh, something she was involved in, as well as conducting experiments with their wireless station. And he said they tested all their new equipment, even when they had a new telephone system installed. He wouldn't let anybody use it until she had. Um, in the early uh, Pennsylvania Wireless Association, she 
attended all the meetings and was deeply uh, respected. Uh, this last comment on the slide about how fond they were of children and talking about kitties and little peepy -pee sparks uh, strikes me particularly um, because of the death, apparent death of their child. So they gave quite a lot of their evening time to talking with um, presumably principally little boys on their tiny wireless sets. Here, Frank's talking about how um, he thought it was very important uh, for men and their wives to jointly pursue something. I would assume if your group here is similar to Mark members, uh, very few wives participate directly. Although I will say my wife has invited, particularly invited a couple radios into the house when she saw me carry them from the truck. Um, in, in Trace and the family, they uh, seem to have always lived where they manufactured the business, uh, conducted their manufacturing. This is a picture of their first home on uh, North 9th Street and it appeared in their ads. And it was a, apparently an apartment building with 21 people living there. So Frank, Hester, and their son, Raymond, and I uh, particularly note that he was called the Wizard of North 9th Street. And that struck me two ways. One, that he was um, so well known that people would apply an appellation like this. And I wondered if it wasn't connected to uh, the Wizard of Menlo Park attributed to Edison. If so, then his local community thought him on a par with that uh, illustrious developer of the light bulb and other items. So they uh, kept in touch her at the wireless home station and he on the road in this picture, he has one of his devices, which was um, a little crystal radio headphones. I know he couldn't put that hat over them, but good for the picture. And presumably he was holding a ground wire on the sewer manhole cover. Um, in 1910, she's quoted um, as really enjoying the fact that she could send out her signals and him receive it, but he, as walking in the evenings doing his business, however he conducted them, he couldn't get back to her. And she delighted, especially knowing that all the local wireless operators were listening and, and chiming in with, uh, Mr. NR, your wife is looking for you. Where are you? She needs you or something of the sort. And he'd have to stop at some uh, wireless operator's house whom he knew just to get back to her, just to keep his side going to some extent. Another reference here to um, uh, them talking to little boys, maybe 10 at a time in an evening. So the product lines uh, were consisted of a wide variety of supplies for amateur use. Um, I do have a catalog that's been um, I've reproduced that will be available to you if you want. And uh, one reason for mentioning that, when I conducted the um, presentation with Mark, two members got back to me and if we have time, I'll show you the examples of more information that they were able to provide. With you all being centered in the Midwest, and they may or may not have come across any FB Chambers equipment, but if you have that or any, literature, I'd be interested to hear about it. But all of this equipment for what I've been able to find was focused on spark transmission and reception. So in order of uh, appearance, the four line ad came out in 1911 and from left to right at the bottom, the ads came out in 1913, 15 and 16. They're very prolific in the 1915 to 1918, but uh, the war cut off a lot of uh, work. You know, you know, certainly nobody could uh, broadcast. But within their um, catalog that uh, will be available to you is his recommendations as shown on the list on the right and pulled from elsewhere was a typical installation uh, pictorial schematic of how they would recommend to be set up. And this is from uh, a source printed in 1922. 
here's a circuit as drawn by Chambers in his catalog and his recommendations for a particular setup. So a couple of pieces of equipment for Spark is helix coil or an oscillation transformer. It you know is simple in design, and I can see how with a much larger upper transformer winding, you would uh, be able to develop a much greater spark. All of this harkening right back to Tesla. I'm not all that familiar with uh, spark equipment, but I know our stone is very much so. There's a chamber's key, and this was a photograph, if I recall right, from the AWA Museum. An antenna switch on a marble base, and possibly refined uh, switch, and I've blown up sections from the photograph that show the imprint of the FB Chambers Company. They made uh, transmitting condensers of glass, and they uh, had various sizes ranging, if you can imagine, from $8 to $64 and $2 each for a quarter per quarter watt if you want a mahogany box. Um, so I'm not sure what the wattage uh, that this could be used with, but imagine what $64 from 1915 or so would translate to today and who could afford that. This is an internet uh, picture I was pleased to find of rotary condensers. This stone set, or uh, the wireless or jeweler set. And uh, what I was given to understand was in the earliest days of wireless, the jewelers used them to set watches by. It wouldn't do to give somebody a watch they just purchased without it being set to the most accurate time possible. So as most advertised couplers are shown here, a 748 and the 749 tuned to 15,000 meters. And I like this particular slide because it mentions near the very bottom a chamber circuit. And long in my mind had been whether or not Chambers was an engineer or um, a Marconi type one who understood what was going on and gathered stuff together to put out to people to make their own thing. So he did have a, a circuit that was commented on by Fezenden uh, or Hazelton, I'm sorry. Here's a loose coupler in my collection, 746. There's a 748. That one's 15 inches versus mine, which is uh, 21, but some were said to be 23. From the catalog is a tuning coil. And here's one that I have. I had acquired this a few years ago before COVID hit from uh, uh, Kutztown. And the windings look so crappy because even though it was advertised that the core would never shrink, it did after 100 years, and the fellow that I bought it from had uh, unloosened one end and then tried to tighten everything up. And so all the neatly worn straight line elements for tuning were all twisted around the uh, core. So here's his um, close up of his portable receiver. And it was like the tuning coil with a you know, crystal detector and a, and a proper uh, fittings for connecting headphones, antenna, and ground. I was real pleased to get these. Um, Brandis uh, headphones marked by, uh, with FB chambers on it. And Brandis has to have done that because uh, I don't see any other way it would have been done, and it's the only known example. If others know of other examples of these headphones, I would be happy to be corrected, but I was real pleased to get this. So his influence in, in many spheres, uh, he was uh, one of the charter members for the Pennsylvania Wireless Association. His experimental station operated on uh, three frequencies at different times. 
and is very prominent in the post-war effort of the government, especially the Navy, that wanted to basically do away with amateur radio operations. And when he presented before Congress, he was representing uh, Washington, uh, the Wireless Association, rather, of Pennsylvania, the Mississippi Valley, and Colorado, plus St. Martin's College in Washington and the amateurs of the 13th Naval District in Puget Sound. And uh, articles about his presentation talked about amusing and graphic word pictures he used in making his testimony. It went on for several pages. And basically, um, it resulted in the amateurs being allowed to work above um, or below 200 meters. So was he a businessman or an engineer? Well, he had a variety of circuits in the catalog. Um, he sold uh, or created them with sparks coils, one with a tube and supplied another business, Merker and Flocker, which is uh, another reference I'll make to him in a moment. And I thought it was interesting. Uh, I don't know how many of you all remember, but I remember uh, in my early childhood that some small purchases could be made with stamps and with chambers. They would accept payment for items up to 50 cents worth. So here's a Hazel Times rendering of a tube circuit uh, that Chambers had created. I've long forgotten my math on this, but still it helped to flesh out whether or not he was an engineer or was he more of a um, educated businessman on the topic. Uh, Merker and Flocker were uh, a Pennsylvania firm, but uh, quite a distance away from Philadelphia, all the way at the west end of the state. And I blew up these uh, particular pictures because they're identical to those uh, found in the catalog. And when I get to the catalog, uh, if we have time, I'll show you a picture because one of the Mark members um, had an item that he got from someone who bought it from Merker and Flockhart, and it's the same item as pictured in the FB Chambers catalog. So after the war, you know, as we know from Armstrong's work, everything changed. The tubes are out, tube circuits were out, and it looked as though really Chambers and company didn't go into the tube work. So we see that apparatus sales, um, telegraphy training became the predominant ads from that point on. Um, I say there was a parent shift to radio sales because in one reference I found that Atwater Kent Manufacturing Company uh, called for a, a meeting trying to get uh, radio jobbers into an association. Most in the, uh, of those attending were musical jobbers, but he felt strongly radios ought to, radio dealers ought to get involved. And of course, with him having a radio company of his own made sense. The reference to Chambers was that they win, he won a window dressing award at that meeting. So I don't know how many um, strictly amateur wireless businesses had uh, window displays, but I doubt that many, if any, did. So that furthered my belief that he was strictly into uh, home type radio sales by that time. Well, Frank died in 68, did find um, an obituary for him, heart attack complicated by uh, arteriosclerosis. And Hester died a couple years later. No cause was given, but she was residing at the Masonic home in Elizabethtown and had been there since her husband's death. And that suggests to me that they re remained uh, lifelong Masons. So he claimed to have been a radio engineer, and at that day and age of his start, that probably was a, an appropriate title. He was a radio station operator doing experimental work. He figured prominently locally, regionally, nationally, and advanced in civilian amateur use of radio to spur scientific development. He was an electrical engineer whose enthusiasm led to radio manufacturing and parts sales 
and that then led or transitioned to telegraphy school with household radio sales. For Hester, her operations of the radio began in 05 and was noted in uh, very far ranging publications as the first licensed woman operator in 1913 and first licensed woman instructor. In fact, the article um, about her obtaining her license said that she uh, vastly outperformed almost all the other men taking the exam at the time. So she was a radio manufacturer and wireless experimenter and retail radio apparatus and household set sales person. As a couple, they were obviously devoted to one another, especially presumably after suffering the loss of their small son. They were particularly supportive of child wireless operators, jointly pursued wireless and its advances and poured their wireless interest into a business on an equal basis. I think he got more notoriety at the governmental level, but at the local level, they were uh, two peas in a pod as far as all who knew them. This is from a 1910 article demonstrating equipment use on the roof of the building that they lived in. Now at the Mark meeting, I had produced a document, well, I'll mention here. The first articles I got was uh, AWA review by uh, Rexford uh, Matlack in 87, and I produced my article in, in AWA review number 32. Ludwell Sibley was particularly helpful, his Radio Age articles, plus he provided me with a copy of Chambers Catalog B24. And Howard Stone uh, allowed me to use pictures of his materials, scores of newspaper articles and trade magazine references, I think, the article has about 120 references. And of course the uh, Ancestry and Wikipedia to give me family history. Um, somebody liked the production of the uh, catalog so well that I handed out at the Mark meeting that I found it on eBay some weeks after the meeting uh, for the sales price of 9.99. And um, I'll uh, stop it here, although there's a picture or two I might add. Um, the catalog reproduced is available um, for those who would want it. And I'd like to uh, share one thing here as soon as I can find it, there it is. Yeah, so this is a couple pages from the catalog. And here's the original page, if you pay particular attention to the middle there that says 1202. And then here's the 1202 that uh, Daniel Sohn from Mark uh, graciously photographed and sent to me because he, because of that handout of the catalog, he was able to document what he had in his collection. The only difference between it and what's in the catalog is, um, I forget what you call when you, put little grooves on the edges of the screw knobs, the metal ones, but that was the only thing that he said differed from the picture. But he had provided that and let me go to another page. I think I want. The grooves that you're talking about, are you talking about knurling? Yes, thank you, Marilyn. And one of the other Mark attendees, can you see the uh, page here that shows the uh, letterhead? Okay, so this was instructions on how to use the uh, jeweler set, but what uh, I found really great was uh, the actual letterhead and that his brother Herbert is listed there as vice president. I had seen from the 1920 census that he resided with the chambers in their uh, household at that time, or at least the building in which they had their household and the business. So that's one of the things I think is so neat about the hobby, the sharing that we do that helps uh, capture what might otherwise be lost or uh, uncorrelated data. So that's probably it for me. And I, um, 
would say too, if you want, um, you can have copies of my presentation slides. Oh, thank you for holding that up. Uh, Bob, Bob Lozier is holding up his copy of the handout. But um, the catalog is available in the chat and you can have my uh, slides too if I went too fast or something got blurred vocally. Well, Bill, thank you so very much for that outstanding presentation. That the amount of research you put into that is uh, truly impressive, and thank uh, you. that was very entertaining. And uh, thanks very much. So, anyone have any questions uh, for Bill right now? I have uh, uh, something to show you. Here's the Chambers Long Wave. Can you see it? <laughs> Move back ways. It's 32 wow. inches long. Yeah, you should look at Howard's website. It's great. I was really pleased to find his information. That was what I wanted to show. I just uh, I don't know that I have that out on my website or not. My website is is functional, but no changes have been made in about eight ten years. Thanks very much, Bill, and. Uh, <laughs> Appreciate it, and we look forward to the future when you have another presentation for us, because that was certainly excellent. One Thank thought you. for Bill, if I may, the little knobs he was talking about, um, that's called knurled, and in different circles, it might be called a spline knurl, and that uh, knurl is, uh, starts with a K. Right, right. Thank you. Certainly. Thank you, Bill. And now I'll introduce uh, our next presenter, who has just spoke a moment ago, Mike Mountain. Um, Mike and I have uh, had a few conversations via email and, and uh, on Zoom, and Matt and I and Mike uh, worked together so that we could uh, present this uh, story about a very interesting Swedish radio that came in a small suitcase. And uh, Mike is up in Plymouth, Michigan, and is a longtime radio guy. In fact, he's had his own radio TV repair shop that he had for many years. He's uh, currently a teacher and worked for GM and it's got a lot of fascinating stories to tell. Uh, but the story right now is about a Swedish suitcase radio. So I will turn it over to, to Matt who will run the slides and Mike and take it away. Well, good morning, everybody. And this is a first for me here on many terms. So I appreciate this fabulous opportunity. And I see on this cover page here, the Swedish radio in a mini suitcase, um, in spite of uh, Matt and Tom's rejection of putting a little credit down there at the bottom, all of this would not have come to pass from me without their input. So their efforts in making this happen are probably on a par with fixing the little radio. So I want everybody to know that. Credit where credit's due, right? So uh, for me, yes, I've been in the radio world since I was 10, which goes back to uh, about 1950, and been working at that ever since along various uh let's say evolutionary steps. And in uh, latter years, well, for the last um, <clears throat> 40 years, let's say, I'm supposed to be retired. Ha! And um, I was doing transistor radio work back then and uh, doing many things simultaneously. And then I you know, kind of changed over to um, doing European and German radios. And in fact, after I got out of the service, um, in 64, um, I joined a radio repair shop, radio television in Redford, Michigan, which is near here. Um, <clears throat> and the owner operator was a German guy. His name was Klaus. And a typical guy like that, um, from his heritage, uh, he, he was impatient, stubborn, but very smart. He had been a POW from World War II who he and his family were smart enough to get here uh, in appropriate timing um, so that he knew all the German people from around town that all came over at the same point in time. So I've been doing specialized in uh, those radios, particularly like Grundig or Telefunken or Blahpunkt, all of these things and the many people that are associated with them. 
So along the way, I ended up uh, one of my clients. Um, he's a German gentleman from Mexico City, where his family uh, resided um, post -war, World War II. So somehow or other, after a year or two, which is customary to find me, um, he brought me several radios along the way, um, typically um, Nazi radios. And um, then he popped up with this one that he found on eBay and supposedly, like eBay, all, they all say, oh, it's working. So of course it didn't work. And this particular radio, and I had done some research and I think uh, Tom and Matt found one of the articles that uh, I did. I think it came from um, the Swedish Radio Museum. It's called, um, called in, down the bottom right-hand corner, yeah, that's it, I call it the Musite. Um, and in all my searchings, nobody had ever seen one of these radios for real or touched it. Um, so anyway, uh, I did find that it was built in Sweden by uh, T.D. Smith and about 1953, and we can only say about that because everybody who knew anything about the radio is all long gone, you know, 70 years ago. So there may be somebody out there uh, who's familiar with it or may well be amongst your guys' group uh, or whoever views your videos uh, who has seen one or has one. I can't believe that uh, the only one around anymore is the one that I had repaired for my customer. Uh, his name is Gustavo. Um, so in any case, um, it was running on a batteries, as you see here, uh, 67 and a half and a 1.5 D cell. And I just happened to notice the other day in the pictures that uh, the guys got for me here, that the D cell kind of looks like it, it has a lot of stuff escaping from it into the radio. So hopefully uh, they got that one out of there. And then down at the bottom left here is a picture from the uh, logo of the company. Uh, which was uh, around for oh, some period of time, I don't remember now, but let's just say from on the order of uh, early 40s until about 1960 or so. And in this article from the Musit, uh, it gives a pretty good demonstration of uh, their timing and uh, the various stages of evolution of uh, acquiring other businesses and being acquired themselves. And uh, I think, as I recall, that there was a picture of this radio in there, and maybe it was mentioned once or twice. Um, and then it was a broadcast in long wave, which is typical from the European radios, and it had four tubes. And when I got this thing, um, as I, it says here, uh, tubes were not correct. There was some, there was like four tubes, and of the four, maybe three of them were, uh, let's say, the functional position correct, but they were not the tube for the radio. So I had to do some research and on the chassis, you can see where I penned in um, the German part numbers for the tubes from back in that era. Then I had to do some cross-reference uh, to find out what the correct numbers were. And on the left-hand side there, you see 3C4, which I don't think in all my years I've ever seen that particular tube. And that's the uh, mixer converter tube for this little radio. And um, finally, I got one from a guy, I think it's called the, the Tube Guy uh, down in Ohio. It's either Cleveland or Cincinnati where he's at. So and then he was, you know, very cordially of his thousands of tubes. He went digging through and he found one. So of course I got it. Uh, then along that line, uh, you can see in this same picture, at the top left, a current battery. I think this is the bunny battery ever ready. And of interest of that battery um, is the top, the way the uh, cap structure is uh, formulated. And uh, as we can see down in the photograph of the chassis, um, in the, within the phenolic wafer that's there in the center, you're gonna see a, a um, device. Uh, in my world, that particular washer is called um, an external tooth uh, shake proof star washer. Um, and you know, there's this, this kind here, and then there's another matching one where the teeth mm -hmm. are on the inside. So it's called an internal tooth shake proof lock washer. So because of the nature of the batteries, uh, which have changed over the years, and we've got a photograph coming up here too, where as you can see, the wafer is held in place by a couple of nice shiny brass rivets. 
And of course, it, it kind of stunned me at first that I would put in a brand new cell and I'd be working on this thing for a while and all of a sudden I discovered the battery is dead. And I couldn't figure out, well, what is going on? I'm looking everywhere. And finally it dawned on me, the battery was hot as hell. <laughs> so I got it out of there. And then I noticed this geometry challenge where because of the depth of the little cup where the button goes, the uh, geometry was perfect for a short between the cap and ground, which are those little rivets. So I had to add that little washer down in there and solder it in to get the battery raised up by what was like oh, maybe 50 thousandths of an inch so that it had some clearance in there and wouldn't suffer problems. Um, and you can see this is a compact package. Um, and part of this is it looks very much like a, oh, let's say a prototype receiver uh, for a Heath kit from back in the day. And the chassis design, uh, there's a couple of things about it. Um, the design from my standpoint, having been a General Motors guy for 30 years, the radio was designed by a challenge called Designed for Assembly. Yes, now you can see that picture there that the, you know, the radio circuitry itself starts up inside the chassis and then the components get built outwards so that you can really have a tough time just trying to get in there to do any measuring or parts removal and replacement. The other aspect of this chassis, which becomes apparent when you start looking around, um, they used dissimilar metals in the grounding circuit. So they used rivets of different kinds, screws of different kinds, and over the years, uh, oh, and then the battery connector for the ground side was a, uh, a spring uh, bronze type of thing with two prongs that rested into the back of the D cell. So between all of these points of contact and uh, the radio is on the order of 70 years old, uh, all of these initiated some corrosion or oxidation where the two dissimilar metals did meet. So I had to run a wire, and it's in one of the pictures here, it's a little green wire from the top of the battery to the uh, ground bus down inside. And in this particular picture here in the center, um, just to the left of the variable cap, you can see up there, there's a combination of uh, rivets and screws. And then the front panel, which is on the far left, is secured to the chassis, one of the little framework pieces with a screw and a nut. And uh, that's a, another failure item there, that there should have been an internal tooth shake proof lock washer on that screw to ensure the grounding. Then in that picture also, uh, you'll see that across the variable cap, and, and I had a hard time trying to get this thing to run. Uh, you know, at first I thought it was just a tube, so I got the right tube and it still wouldn't go. The oscillator just would not run. And you can see from the circuit trying to get down inside of there to make any measurements is really tough. So then it dawned on me, well, da, 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 and we see here it's listed as a 10 puff cap that was across the capacitor. So this particular radio, instead of having a trimmer capacitor, it is adjustable for setting, let's say the 1600 uh, portion of the dial, they picked out a, a general purpose little capacitor, which was on the same uh, type as what you see there with the two little rivets holding the thing together and a couple of spaghetti covered wires. So rather than, uh, and, and hide something that's ugly because the owner just, he wanted to repair it, just a, a correct repair, but don't change the radio. I and mean, we could start char changing all the capacitors in there to do uh, a refreshing of the radio, so to speak, but he didn't want to do that. He wanted more or less original uh, for preservation, um, but he wanted it to work, at least at this point in his life. So I used a 10 puff a little, uh, uh, you know, PF capacitor, which is probably the size of a flattened P and long wires coming out of it. And uh, I put some tubing on there, but as it, you know, you can see this thing is laying right across the uh, variable. And nah. so I had to put some shrink tubing on there. So <laughs> to me, uh, if it was for viewing for people such as yourself, I might've done it a bit differently but it was meant for a repair that would probably never see daylight again. 
Um, plus, you know, all these things that I'm repairing all these years, one of my philosophies is um, my hands will be the last ones to ever touch it because there's nobody around here or anywhere that uh, repairs any of this stuff. No less even looks at it. So here we find another slide showing, of course, the 67 and a half volt battery. And to get this thing working and give back to uh, my client, I took uh, seven nine volt batteries, all daisy chained together. And they do fit in the battery compartment quite nicely. Um, and then on the right, you see the two batteries here. And there's an arrow pointing at the cap um, and the button design versus uh, there's the Duracell over there. So you can compare that uh, the the old ever ready um, was not prone to shorts because it's got a paper case on it where the uh, Duracell is really prone to a short in this particular radio. So that's where we find the name there. I put it on there. The guys put it on there. External tooth shake proof lock washer. Um, let's see what else can we tell you about this thing. Oh, now there's the top of the screw on the gold panel, um, which makes for a very poor ground because the front panel I think is like a, some kind of anodizing. So that's another dissimilar metal. Now the power switch, which is up against the lid in the assembled radio. Now this is, this is the top side of the radio. And uh, there's a little push bar or whatever you want to call it. Um, and this kind of a design is used on a number of radios where the cover of the radio opens, you know, when you open the cover, it releases uh, the pressure on a little switch like this uh, to turn the radio on. And that's kind of unique. But in this radio, uh, unlike others, the switch button, as you see it, is the same dimension as the cut in the little metal panel that it's in, inserted into. So it, when you take this radio out of the case, if you're not careful, if you look at that little pin, cross-eyed, it's going to go flying out into your bench somewhere, never to be seen until next year. So and you got to be very careful with it. There's just, there's no restraining of it, like an extra little groove to retain it. And the function of that, uh, as you can see there, is uh, against two leaf contacts, which are riveted into that little circuit, all right? And of course, after all these years, those leaves get really weak over around the, the um, rivet area. You can see there's a sharp bend over there. And the, when you release that button, as you see it in the current state, those two leaves are supposed to be springy enough that they contact um, a uh, soldered pin, if you will, or like it's kind of like a little flat solder lug that is supposed to make contact with the two leaf pieces there. Uh, and it's a real challenge, of course, if some of you have seen this kind of thing before, so that when you got the, the pin released, that it's enough springiness to recontact those two little pins. But what happens is if you don't get everything just right, when you close the lid on that pin, it pushes against the two leaves and then it bends them back out of shape so that they don't make contact anymore. So that's one thing you've got to be very careful of right there. Let's see. So here's the radio. Now, this particular radio that we have here, um, as uh, Matt and Tom found, I believe they got this from the, the uh, Musique. Um, this is of somebody's choice. They might have even gotten this picture from the uh, uh, Italian radio restorer. Um, the case is, in this instance here, is beautiful leather, well-maintained, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the one that I was working on, because it was aged and really not taken very good care of, uh, the leather corners of the cover were stretched apart and the threads holding them together are stretched apart. And there's really no way to repair the cover and have it close properly again. Uh, one thing to note here is on the left-hand photo, you can see that little plunger switch over there in the corner. And part of the difficulty with this radio is that the antenna leads um, go to the antenna, which is inside that little button on cover inside the lid, but they tend to lay across the switch, which gives it extra push down pressure, which tends to bend them. Then of course, on the right, you see a little cover plate that's over there. And on the far right of its side, there's a little latch pin that uh, you rotate around to pop that up to get at the batteries. 
Uh, let's see what else can we tell you about. I guess basically that's it. Oh, yes, yeah. <laughs> it was a quick shot of um, my shop. I just had to forward them today. I had promised it. Yeah, and it's messy as all good radio shops are. Um, and you can see all the big radios. And uh, it, many years, decades ago, when I supposedly retired and I rebuilt all of this, this was a two and a half car garage, uh, which had been my one of my shops. You know, it's. Um, 25 by 25 so I had a lot of a lot of worker bees um, in there and I retired and I figured okay I'm going to play with my transistor radios and I'm going to spend a, a lot of money and make my uh, uh, my office and home away from home um, so I had you know the floor raised and, and carpeted and all that on this half over here uh, with like a four foot aisle so there'd be plenty of room for me in the chair um, to you know, waddle around in there. But as time went by, one person found out uh, I repaired old radios. And of course, you know, it's kind of like the bill before I mentioned the COVID is like the COVID bacteria. Next thing you know, next week, because you did one, you got two more. And as it is now, uh, I'm you know, between a year to a year and a half behind on repairing German radios or European radios. Um, and there's nobody else around and um, people wait. They, most all of them, they don't even ask the price. They just ask about getting it repaired and how long is it going to take, etc. A friend of mine on the other side of Plymouth, he's the only one around anymore, he repairs the con American console radios, like you see one of right there. Um, and he's only three years behind on doing he, his radios. Um, so the other side of the of this garage behind those cabinets, you see there's another row of cabinets um, plus I have a classic car in that half. That was going to be my other uh, hobby, so to speak. So as it is now, um, I'm doing all these radios. And uh, here we see a nice uh, reference um, page. And let's see, what else can we tell you? Oh, uh, it was either, I think it was a radio museum or the Musite. At the time that I was doing my research, which is maybe a year and a half ago by now, um, they did show a picture of the uh, radio chassis uh, outside of the little case. And along with that, there was, I'm going to call it a specification page. And the specification page gave all four tubes, including a number for the mixer oscillator, which uh, and I happened to look up at the chassis in a magnifying glass. And the tube that sits in the, that socket, I'm pretty sure it was either that one or the uh, output tube were two different numbers, which were not compatible. So the, you, know, you have to be careful with what you're looking for in something like that. So, oh, excuse me, some, somebody else looking to get their radio repaired, I'm sorry. <laughs> so in any case, uh, Matt and Tom, they've got some information uh, about me. So if you or anybody else has any questions about such things, feel free to give me a call. And as soon as I can, I'll be able to give you a buzz back. So thank you very much for this opportunity to share. And I've got to leave now because I've got commitments coming out of my ears. But uh, certainly, I hope to hear from one or more of you at any time at your leisure. Take care and have a great, safe weekend. Well, thank you very much, Mike. That was an excellent presentation. And if there's any questions for Mike before he gets out of his chair. Well, I might uh, remark there you had a nice picture that showed the... Uh, uh, Hellison brand uh, batteries in there. And Hellison was uh, a, a, a European manufacturer headquartered in, in uh, Denmark. And uh, they, they sold, uh, they actually had uh, some sort of a factory in the United Kingdom and maybe also in Sweden. But I know they had one in, in uh, Spain. So Hellison is a, was a well-known brand of uh, dry battery makers in, in uh, Europe. Yes. Oh, and, and in fact, along with that, you can't buy these batteries anymore, as many of you have found out. Um, the American manufacturers, the RCAs, etc., they all got out of that business for numerous reasons. And I think one of them might have been, uh, you know, ecology, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, from, uh, con you know, metallic uh, contaminations. And then um, the... I think it was the Chinese 
bought the battery rights for carbon zinc batteries and they were making batteries for a couple of years that I've got about 30 or 40 radios that use that kind of uh, battery and all of a sudden poof they were all gone so now you got to improvise or have nothing but thanks for your thought anybody else that was a okay. great presentation i just wanted to mention to you, you must be neighbors with mark Olpat, doesn't he live in plymouth michigan too the, the man who does the uh, volume controls and things yes that's mark um i've known him since he was about 14 years old oh wow and, <laughs> oh yeah uh, he's the guy I was just talking about that does the American consoles. Yeah. Um, I do I do a little table model Americans, you know, the All-American Fives. So every once in a while, he gets overloaded and he hands me one or two of those to do for him, for his clients. <laughs> I get a lot of my parts from him. Sure. And at one point in time, oh, I don't remember how old he was, maybe uh, later teens, uh, he worked for me in uh, one of my shops back in the day. So, yes, we've known each other for a long period of time. Oh, neat. That's great. Well, that's great. And, you know, uh, we put uh, Mike's contact information earlier into the chat window. So if you need to get a hold of Mike via email or phone, uh, just save off the chat and you can find that uh, information. So if there's uh, any other questions for Mike, Shout them out. Otherwise, we'll move on to our third and final presentation of the day. Okay. Well, thank you, Mike. Well, thank you all for your questions and your silence. Yeah. I, I will now introduce uh, Ben Erickson, who uh, I met for the first time at Radio Fest. And uh, Ben is a longtime ARCI member. And uh, he had uh, a few tables at Radio Fest, and I bought some grow cloth from him, and he's got a wonderful website uh, that you can see there that uh, he sells a lot of different things, including 3D printed parts. And today he's going to share with us a little bit of information about uh, this uh, fascinating topic on how we can recreate things that uh, you just can't find anymore. So, Ben, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Ben Erickson. I've been um, collecting radios, repairing radios since the late 80s. And, and one of the things that um, I've always been challenged with is, is trying to locate parts. And so I kind of got into uh, 3D printing parts uh, out of necessity. I was, I was trying to remember, like, what were some of the first parts I produced? And you may be familiar with some of these, um, these tabs off of Zenus, but I found some of these uh, broken on radios and and um, you know, or or damaged, and so this is this is one of the first parts that I I three D printed. I also, you know, some of these pointers were, you know, I think people have attempted to pull the pointers off of the radios and then and then snapped them, uh, as well as little these little type of tabs that uh, you know are prone to fall off on on the Zenith radios. Showing in front of my face <laughs> just some of the some of the little the little parts and tabs that. Uh, that I've printed. So I'll show those here briefly um, in, in the presentation. Um, but you know, you know, why did why print parts versus other methods? You know, I there's there's um, you know, you could do molding, you could do um, but um, you know, one of the nice things about 3D printing is is you can uh, print with with zero tooling costs, you know, you don't need uh, tooling. So if you look at the picture here. Um, and you, can you see my screen now with the uh, with a picture of the speaker cover? Yeah, yeah, we see it. Yeah, so so imagine if you had a if you had to create a mold for this and 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 uh, make that from a mold, you know, it, it it would be very expensive to do that. You know, and with three D printing, you don't you know you could add lots of complexity, and it's it's not really costing anymore. Um, you can print out a variety of materials, you know, so I've printed, you know, out of plastic, I've printed out of rubber materials, wood, metal. Uh, so there's a lot, lots of options available now. It's just, you know, it's, it's just getting um, better and better, the technology. I mean, I think when I first started uh, printing, 
um, you know, the quality wasn't so good. And, and now um, it's, um, you know, it's, it's greatly improved and it's improving every year. Uh, you have the ability to print multiple colors, textures, and materials at the same time. Uh, the nice thing about 3D printing, it's, it's zero, uh, zero waste. You know, so if you were doing like a CNC carving or something, you're, you're generating, uh, you know, dust and waste material or 3D printing, you know, you're just using the material to print uh, the part that you want. Um, the digital file can be reprinted forever. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of time that's put into, you know, creating that initial file, but then, you know, it's, it's available for forever to be reprinted. And, um, you know, parts can be designed and produced on your desk. You know, you don't need a, a, a big workshop to uh, make these types of parts. And the, and the quality of the three printing is hitting the tipping point of other methods like, um, you know, like molding of, of parts. And I'll just, uh, I'm gonna go out of the presentation for a minute here. Um, and I just show you this particular file. Can you can you see the do you see the speaker now where I'm kind of moving it in a 3D? Yeah, you see that. Yeah. yeah. So if you if you see this, like this is the hopefully everybody knows what this is. It's like a cover for the Zenith uh, radio speaker. Um, and you can see here um, in the inside, you have this 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 cap that that goes up against the speaker. When this was originally made, this was made out of fiber, and uh, you'd have to do it. You know, you'd have a, a mold to make this outer 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 part, and you'd have a, a separate mold to make the inner part. Where with 3D printing, you could print this all as one piece. Um, you know, the same thing with other complicated uh, parts. And the nice thing here is, is like this. You know, let's say you wanted to. I noticed somebody had a, a picture or had a, a Walton sitting next to him. Let's say you wanted to make this a smaller size and make it, you know, you, you wanted to kind of, you want to innovate and customize a, a, a smaller radio with this type of design. You know, it's, it's, it's very easy to shrink this down to, um, you know, any variety of sizes that you need for speaker that uh, you're working on. Can you use a baffling material as a material? What's that? A baffling, some sort of baffling material uh to absorb the sound you know yeah i mean like you, you could print out of fiber materials you okay. know so there's 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 different fiber materials there's there's rubber materials like i i i printed parts that are like um you know grommets for radios too um that are made out of like a a rubber type of material so it's yeah it, 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 there's there's different materials coming out all the time uh to be able to uh, make make these parts from uh, so there's today I'm going to I'm not going to go into a great deal, great amount of detail, but I just want to talk about the three step process to make a radio part. Uh, the first one is create a 3D digital drawing. Uh, the second is 3D part printing and then uh, post uh, po po post part processing. So when, whenever you 3D print, um, you know, at the end, you may need to do some processing of uh, you know, to make it into the final product. And one of the things that um, you know I've started creating is, is a digital radio parts library, and uh, this is um, I currently have this available um, in in Shapeways, but I, but you can see here some of the different uh, radio parts uh, uh, that I've that I've created. I'm looking I'm looking to create more. I'm, I'm just curious, um, you know, from the audience here, you know, if there's interest in you know developing a, a digital parts library. Um, you know, if you can, if you can contact me and, and just, just, you know, tell me the kind of interest or ideas that you may have uh, for that in the future. Um, but step one, you, cr you create the digital drawing of the part. And there's, there's several methods available depending on your budget, time, and experience. Um, you know, one real simple way is to do a web search for an STI, STL file for your part. Uh, there are maybe people that, you know, have have um, needed a, a specific part. Like I'll, I'll find a lot of parts of like um, it's like that pot metal zinc type of material where people have created gears um, and, and different things for radio parts that you know are, are prone to failure. Um, 
you know, but if you can't find it, find it with a web search, uh, you could use CAD software to create the part. Of course, this, you know, <laughs> requires some knowledge uh, to be able to do that. Um, you could um, approach a local community college. Uh, you know, they're, kind of, they're looking for student projects um, in their drafting courses. Uh, you could take them the part and have uh, a student uh, recreate the part for you in a digital file. Can you uh, there do are, it yourself? What's that? Can you do it yourself? You can't. You can't do oh. it yourself. No, yeah, I'm yeah. talking about you. Oh yes, yes, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, I I could do it myself. Um, but you know, I'm just giving some options. So like, if you didn't, if you don't have experience uh, doing the, you know, the CAD drawing and stuff, uh, if you want to have the, you know, the ability to be able to, you know, to to recreate your part, you don't have to spend. Uh, you know, uh, weeks and months trying to learn uh, how to do uh, CAD drawing. So <laughs> if, if, I, I mean. if, if I sent you a part, you would be able to duplicate it for me? Correct. Yes. How yeah, big bar, uh, How big a part can you do? You could, you could do a, a part that's um, like the size of a five-gallon pail would be the biggest part. Whoa. And then you could do, you know, you know, very small parts. So... Um, the, w the one thing that you can do with 3D printing is if you wanted to, to, to if you need a really large part, um, you could, you could um, print it several different times. So let's say you're, it's the size of two five gallon buckets. <laughs> you know, it's like maybe you want to recreate a whole radio. Um, you could print those in sections and they could be uh, assembled together. Um, another, another really nice uh, option is 3D scanning. Uh, so I've, I've used Northern Illinois University to, uh, to do 3D scanning. There are, there are also like local maker spaces. Like um, I live outside of Aurora, Illinois, and, and there is a maker space in Aurora where, where they also offer 3D scanners that you can check out and scan parts. Um, you could also, you know, use uh, Draftsman, um, digitization services like my company, Big River Hardware. Or uh, UPS uh, over in Naperville, Illinois, they they also do uh, digitization services as well. Okay, so then the, the next step is is uh, 3D print the part. So there's there's several different methods. I mean, if you if you if you invested in a 3D printer, um, you know that that could be one way to uh, you know print your part right there at your desk at your at your house. Um, you could use local maker spaces, like here's a picture of one at the Aurora Public Library where they have several different types of printers, they have different types of uh, materials that you can uh, print out of. You know, this is really low cost. I mean, they're, they're, they're basically charging you um, uh, the cost, the weight of the finished product is, what, is how it's being charged. Uh, the, if you choose different colors, uh, the, um, there's, there's not any change in the, in the, in the material cost. Uh, another option is uh, the UPS store. Uh, throughout the US, a lot of the UPS stores have three, 3D printing capability like this one in Naperville uh, where you could have the parts printed. Um, and then, or you could use an online service like Shapeways in, in New York City. And so if you have the 3D image, uh, you, could, you could take a look at the Shapeways website and. Uh, you know, they offer a, a lot more uh, material types uh, to be able to print versus the other options. So he, here's just a little snapshot of, um, you know, some, some 3D, a 3D part that I've printed. So you can see here on the right hand side is the original part. Um, and then in the middle is, is when I printed it out of nylon and this and the part on the left is after I I process the part, I, I stain the part uh, to have the finished product. And Shapeways, uh, for example, has 24 different types of materials from plastics to metal. Um, this particular part that I printed here was made out of uh, natural nylon. And what's really nice about natural nylon is it, it has the weight and feel like Bakelite. Uh, you know, it's a very heavy, heavier type of um, material it's durable um, it's sustainable with fabric dye so if you if you uh, you know go to the fabric sex section at, the, at your 
uh, local um, store that you could use the writ dye any variety of colors to stain uh, stain the printed part after it's done and it's also paintable here's and I, I included here a link to a material guide but like um, let me sh let me show you really quickly here um, the types of materials that they have can you can you see this list here yeah we can see that. yeah yeah it looks all right so you can see here, I mean, it's 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 amazing the type of materials you could print out. Now here's, you know, you could hit silver, um, uh, platinum, gold, copper, brass, bronze, stainless steel, aluminum, steel, um, you know, different types of, um, here's a gypsum type of material, different types of nylons, um, you know, so 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 and it tells you a description, you know, the type of finishes, the colors that are available. You know, it's just it's just amazing the, um, you know, the flexibility and diversity of, of being able to print uh, materials. And so, so I typically if I want to print something out of metal, um, you know, I'll print it out of a lower cost material to begin with. Make sure it, uh, the look and the fit is right uh, before I print uh, from a, a metal type of material. If I uh, sent you uh, like a Bakelite, I'm not Bakelite, hot metal, you know, that's warped, you know, damaged. Yes. Can you, can you uh, if I sent you one that had uh, a slight warp in it, could you take the warp out? Yes, ex ex exactly. Okay. Yeah, but it's, it's funny. I've had some, I've, I've done some parts in the past where people want to leave the imperfection and I have other, other uh, times where it's, you want to make it perfect again. And um, yeah, and that's and that's a that's a great point that you raise. If if you were to do the 3D scanning option, you're gonna if if your part has any defects, all those defects will will remain. If you do a 3D design, um, you do you, you know then all of the defects can be uh, corrected, and 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 you could also improve the the part from what it was originally because sometimes maybe you want to make the part more robust. Um, so you could you can improve the part design too as well. Okay, so the next is post processing a part, and so uh, here here are some of the materials that I use to stain a white nylon knob. So I I, I have the the white nylon knob here in the bottom portion. I'll I'll add uh, vinegar and my and the writ dye that I want to uh, change the color of the knob. I'll, I'll, I'll microwave this uh, to where it's uh, boiling, drop the knob in there for, you know, like a minute as, 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 as dark as I want it. And then, and then that post-processing step is done. Um, so here you can see I, I'm staining it. Uh, you know, you can, you could, you, you could sand it with sandpaper. You can, here I'm, I'm smoothing it with a, with a torch. Um, and then on the right hand side, then I'm adding the, the threads uh, to be able to add a set screw into uh, the material. So I'll, I'm going to show you a quick video of, of this, of the flame, flaming the knob uh, to do the post processing. Yeah, so you can see, you can see there. That's um, you know just using a, a a propane torch. It's just um, you know you're able to smooth the surface of a 3D printed uh, part. You know, it's it's 3D printing is great for complicated parts. You can see here, um, you know, some a, a variety of parts that uh, I've printed. Over in the bottom left is. Uh, the part that I mentioned at the beginning was one of the first parts that I was um, uh, 3D printing. Those little tabs, uh, but you could do pointers out of metal. Um, you could do a variety of different parts. So what's next? Um, you know, there's. I have the QR code here. If you wanted to take, you know, take a look at my website or contact me, you can scan that with your camera. But you know, I, I really, I really, really would like to to create a digital parts library. 
Um, and, and I was thinking of this, um, you know, make a part, give a part mission where, you know, if we can, um, you know, make those digital files of parts, you know, make those available, uh, you know, for others in the future. Um, you know, so it's, you know, like we've, uh, you know, created uh, just regular pictures. There's, there's some times where there, somebody may want a part and then it's, and then, uh, you know, all of the work involved is, is creating that 3D um, digital file. So it'd be great to ha have a library of parts available for people uh, in the future. Uh, I'd like to be able to 3D print an entire radio, um, 3D printed capacitors, you know, how, why not even create a 3D printed vacuum tube, you know? So I think there's, there's a lot of things that can be uh, recreated that could help, uh, you know, help preserve the history as well as, um, you know, get uh, younger, the younger generation interested in antique radios. So thanks a lot for your time. I hope hopefully this helps you uh, and inspire you to um, know how to make uh, 3D printed parts. Well, thank you, Ben. That, that was a really eye opener of a presentation. And uh, I think it's it's a fascinating topic that I'm intrigued by, and yeah, inter a lot of our members are as well. May I interject a little thought here? Um, ben came by uh, my home one uh, time to uh, uh, relinquish me some of my surplus radios. Uh, thank you, Ben. And he showed me, <laughs> he, he showed me some of these uh, uh, samples, and it's it's mind blowing. Uh, I, in my own personal opinion, I've dealt with repro parts before, and in my own opinion and my vision, I, I think his, his quality exceeds uh, that of what he was showing me, both the wooden type and the plastic type. Remember those samples that, that you showed me, Ben? Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, and those were pretty good. And I also didn't know that you were you were you were a big river hardware. I've ordered from you before and I'm <clears throat> I'm impressed with your product. So just a shameless plug. That's it. I'm done. <laughs> Thanks for sharing all that stuff with me. Well, that was fantastic. I'm just curious, how long does it take to uh, print out such a beehive speaker cone? That's a pretty big <laughs> item. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, I, yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I don't have a, I, actually, I don't even own a printer. So, oh, okay. um, so I wouldn't know how long it takes to, uh, to print the item. <laughs> okay. That's, that's that one thing. That's, that's one thing you don't need like expensive equipment to get into uh 3d printing parts you know I, I like to use the local maker spaces i like to use the uh services so so for a part like that i would use a, a, a service to print it out but i think it's uh it's several hours to be able to print out a beehive speaker that's a pretty <laughs> large least, yeah. component yeah what's the cost of the some of this stuff i mean is it very high to have it uh scanned as far as uh 3d getting a 3d image and then uh printing it um they go by the hour or how does that work? Yeah, well, it, it depends on what methods you're using and how, what, you know, how fast you want, want it done, you know, so I've, you know, so if, if you're doing a student project, you can get the, you can get the part made for, you know, for free, right? But it's going to take some time to be able to get the part made. Um, if it's part of a class project, um, it could, um, you know, as well as the quality, you know, so if you're using like a, a, a local community college, you know, you may get a really talented student or you may not get a talented student where there may be some correction. Now, if you're using a service like um, UPS or Big River Hardware, uh, UPS, they, you know, they'll, they'll charge, uh, you know, by the hour type of fee. Um, you know, there's also services, uh, you know, like Big River Hardware, there'll be like a a per part uh, fee to 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 uh, recreate the part. You know the scanning the scanning at the at Northern Illinois University. Um, I think that was uh, you know it was a, a by hour type fee, uh, but it was very nominal cost. The one I thing have... with three D scanning is is like I said, it, it, all the perfections. If if your part's damaged at all, <laughs> that'll you know you know, that will show through. I have a, a picture I can show here if, 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 uh, if I'll do a share screen here. Um, let's see. So I, I do mainly uh, restoration of 1920s radios. 
And the Colster Model 6D of 1926 is absolutely notorious for collectors because of the pop metal that's used in those uh, radios. And uh, so I designed, uh, this is a dim dimensionally accurate uh, recreation of the pop metal part that always breaks apart. The um, uh, I used to do 3D uh, design work in a, a contract engineering firm. And uh, one of the big problems that I've seen so far is that the pop metal parts that I wanna recreate from the 1920s, uh, you can't use cheap materials to uh, generate this. This particular one was done in, uh, in nylon. And even a nylon print, uh, from a, a third party printer, uh, it costs $50 plus uh, shipping to, uh, uh, to get this frame made. And it required some uh, post-processing of, of drilling and tapping holes and so forth. And then also, of course, you, you don't use white nylon, but the great thing about uh, nylon of this type is that it paints really easily. So I was able to paint it with a, with a medium gray and put a little staining on it. And it looks like really good pop metal right now. So uh, that's a, an example of what can be done, but th there is an expense to it and there is, there is time. And uh, you don't jump in and get a usable part first time around that you get into this 3D printing business. So that's that's my comment for now. Thanks, Robert. Ben, I have a question. How do you print in metal? It just it's a, it's the same as so if you use a service like Shapeways, um you can you can 3D print like if you're if you're printing a plastic part and you said well I want I want that in metal, it's just it's it's the same ordering process. Um, I don't know technically maybe somebody else does on the uh, on the call you know what that process looks like, but um, pretty much the 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 parts that are pr printed out of plastic they look exactly the same printed out of metal at least the ones I get from a service like Shapeways, but I haven't seen, I haven't actually seen the equipment or anything of how that's, you know, okay. how they're doing. Well, that. My, my information may be a little bit old on this, but you have to keep in mind that uh, metal printers start at about $150,000 and go up. And they're, they uh, usually use a, a powdering uh, print method in which in which the metal is centered in an oven afterwards, and there's some fancy calculation that has to go on to uh, uh, the the part you print is not actually the same size as the part that gets delivered because it shrinks during the centering process. So, and that all translates to uh, uh, big bucks, but uh, uh, for a one shot deal. So. Uh, my impression is uh, metal, actual true metal printing uh, is, uh, is, is you're not going to get $50 parts. All right. Well, Ben, I've already emailed you pictures of something I'm looking for. So uh, great. Yeah. Uh, yeah. This, this, you, you, everybody may be familiar with, with one of these. You know, this is off of a Zenith. But this this same part this is this is this one's out of plastic, you know. You can get also get this printed out of brass, you know. And so I and and I think they like a service like Shapeways is able to, you know, um, they own all the parts of their the cost of the equipment and stuff is distributed amongst all their customers. Um, and I found that the the size and everything it's it's pretty consistent. Uh, if you order a plastic part and then it's you know whatever dimensions that your, your, your part is in the drawing, 
it's going to be what you receive. Um, so that's, that's a nice thing. Uh, so they have, have really good quality control for that. Well, the, so picture I, the picture I sent you is a knob I've been searching for for a year and I've not been able to find. Great. Thanks a lot. So, so Ben, could you just give us a ballpark cost of those items you just showed in front of us <clears throat> there on the screen? Is yeah. So, so if, if you, yeah, yeah, if you, if you were to get, you know, it's, it's usually about double the price, you know, or at least for a, a plastic part versus a metal part. Um, so you're talking like a, for a pointer like that, it would cost you probably like a hundred dollars to, you know, have that um, printed out of metal. Um, you're talking like twenty dollars if you're having it printed out of plastic. And, this, and, it, and it's the smaller the part, the, the less costly it's going to be, the less weight. Um, of course, if you, if you go for, for um, you know, I think like the, for metal, it's, if it's you know, just regular steel is, is the least expensive. Um, nylon is probably the least expensive uh, plastic uh, that, you can, that you could use. But at the at the, at the library, you know, if I was to print if I was to print that pointer at the library, it would probably cost me five dollars. You know, but because the quality wouldn't be quite as good. I see. Any more questions for Ben? I, I I'm fascinated by this this technology. It kind of brings us into the uh, current state of 3D printing, and uh, it it's an avenue to help restore things that maybe can't be restored anymore. And uh, I think our uh, our hobby is full of things like that. You mentioned the database of the, I think it was, was it STL files? Other than searching, you know, doing a Google search for the STL files, are, are there any uh, libraries that you know of, uh, you know, common community sort of uh, places to, to look to see if files already exist? Yeah, and that's and that's where I, I'm I'm wanting to create one that's you know specifically for radio parts because there's there's a, there's a lot of um, you know different um, databases out there. It's one's called cults3d.com. Um, you know, there's uh, there, there's 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 several different da databases, but you have to go through a lot of files in order to, and, and, you know, you have to go through the images. So, you, so it's almost better to do like an image search, like you take a picture of your part and then, and then do a, an, a Google image search for that. Um, but um, I think that's that's where there's opportunities is, is to make a database, you know, bring bring all those STL files together. Uh, so people can search for a particular, you know, um, maker of a radio, um, model of a radio in order to, you know, find the, the, the part that they want. Because I, I have, a, I, know, I know several different people around the country that are making different 3D parts and, and um, but there's not any, you know, so I, there's not really any central place where you can go to access all of those. It's not on GitHub or anything like that. Yeah, I'm not familiar with that. Well, if you're a radio amateur and you get QST magazine this month, there's a, a an article on uh, using 3D printing uh, for radio amateur product uh, projects, and in one of the articles there it it does some name dropping of some of those uh, uh, libraries. Uh, and uh, so I don't remember what they are, but if you can get hold of a latest copy of QST, uh, uh, you may f uh, find some library uh, or links to libraries in there. Yeah, and I'll, I'll put one in the chat here that um, you know I've used in the past. Thanks, both guys. Okay. Well, um, that's that's all great stuff, Ben. I'm, uh, it's, it's an eye opener for me to understand the, the state of the art there. And um, if you haven't been to uh, Ben's website, you should check it out. He's got a lot of different things there besides 
just uh, 3D printed parts. He's got grill cloth amongst other things uh, for radio restoration. So uh, thank you, Ben. And if there's no further questions for Ben, what we'll do now is get ready for the show and tell section. But before we go do the show and tell, I always like to ask everybody at the end of the presentations, if you would like to be a presenter, because presenters are what make this thing work. So um, there's a little poll questionnaire box that flipped up there on the screen. And if you're interested in being a presenter, please, please uh, say you'll do it. And you don't have to be an expert on making presentations. As Mike Mountain said earlier, uh, he worked with uh, Matt and myself to create that PowerPoint presentation. And uh, he just provided the photos and we did the rest. And in, in such a fashion, we can help bring a lot of your knowledge and technical expertise from the past and bring it into the present and share it with everybody. So please consider being a presenter. And with that being said, I will now move us to the show and tell portion of our meeting. And so whoever has a show and tell at this point, let's hear it. Hello, this is Bill Ballad. Hi, Bill. Um, I have a, a, a quick show and tell if, uh, if you'd like it. Let me see if I can get the share to work. What I have, and I, I'll, I guess I'll not share the picture, I, I found a Detrola. Uh, this is very curious. It's a, um, it's a Detrola Model 101. And unfortunately, if I can't share the picture, you can't see it. What it is, is a radio that was... Uh, in that uh, it's actually a uh, an award uh, sort of thing. It's um, got a label on front, and it says um, for a good job. And uh, the radio itself is rather curious. It's a 1935 Detrola Model 101, a um, four tube. Um, ACDC set um, with, um, um, it, it uses uh, four tubes on it um, and then had a, um, a um, series resistance built into the power line. In any case, um, the curious thing is that there's um, this Detrola, rather nifty case, um, but apparently there's, there are, they, they made several different models of the same uh, chassis, but uh, changing the circuitry. Um, there's a YouTube presentation about a, a Detrola 104. It turns out to be almost exactly the same mechanical construction using a superheterodyne. The radio I have, the 101, is not a superheterodyne. It's a radio free receiver. So um, what I've got is um, there are two different chassis, um, uh, mechanically identical, but uh, using entirely different circuitry. Um, my biggest problem with this thing is the uh, is getting the series filaments to operate. The early um, four tube ACDC radios used um, a filament string that um, used two 25 volt tubes and then uh, two six volt tubes in the RF section. Um, and then a series resistance uh, in series with the, uh, the filaments and you need 163 ohms, uh, which was supplied with the power line. But of course we can't get, or I can't get uh, uh, the proper three, three conductor cord with a, with a um, resistance wire as one of the conductors. What, what I did was replace the, uh, put in a, a uh, simply a series resistance of 160 ohms, which is what the uh, power cord would have. Now, does anybody have a good idea on replacing these 160 ohm resistors? That's what I've got. Okay. Well, Bill, but thanks for that, that share. Um, 
Anybody else have a show and tell? I know, I know we have at least one more. I've been using wire wheel brushes to restore radios for a long time, and I uh, came across a a nylon impregnated with grit wheel. And this little video that my son put together for me shows how I use this thing to clean off chassis, and it works great. I tell you, it's it's much better than a, a, a wire thing. The, the wire is very coarse and tears things up, but this thing, it works great. You can hit your hand with it and you won't tear your skin apart. And it's basically nylon with some uh, grit in it. This is a medium grit. It comes in coarse and fine. And it for, for taking rust off of metal chassis, it, I, it's, it's great. And uh, you don't have to mess with chemicals and stuff. So uh, I put together this quick little video. And you, you can't get into all the cracks with this wheel. But uh, it also works on wood. I, if you did this with a wire, brush you would tear your your wood apart and it, you'd ruin the wood but this does not this is more like it's beating the wood and sanding it and uh, I use it to get in those little cracks and crevices on uh, non-veneer parts particularly and uh, it's, it's not intended to remove all the finish but if the finish is brittle enough this works great it just takes it right off it does not uh, it, it's kind of like a 220 sandpaper, so it's not uh, real harsh. And uh, do they so uh, the do they use it uh, for like Dremel tools? They make them for Dremel tools. I have not found it for a Dremel tool. I, you know, here's here's what I I bought. I bought it at Ace Hardware. You know, they make this is a medium, this is a coarse, and they also make a smaller one that uh, you put this in your drill. This this one doesn't work as well because you don't get the RPMs up as high as, as you do, you know, at, at the uh, circumference of this. And then the other thing that's real helpful is you buy an extension uh, for your drill, and you know, it's got a little magnet in the end, and you can just put that in there, and it won't fall out. And this allows you to get into some of the cracks and crevices. But that's my show and tell. I this is something I discovered this summer, and it, it just works really great. Hey Rudy, I I have found those at flea markets, so you may want to go over to. Uh, do they still have it at the up there in Arlington, or Roselle or wherever it is, Rosemont? Well, I have looked uh, for uh, like the Dremel size uh, abrasive wheels uh, or, or uh, brushes, something like. Uh, I would like to have one that was like uh, an inch to inch and a half inch diameter. And uh, the last time I checked, they didn't have any small ones like that. I, I've seen the, uh, I guess that's three or four inch diameter uh, uh, wheels that uh, Tom was showing. But I'd like something much smaller. Yeah, they have like the horse hairs and the wire brushes, but not, not the... Uh... Nylon, what he's talking about. Yeah. That pretty much concludes the uh, the main scheduled programming of our uh, virtual forum today. So thanks everybody for participating and presenting especially. And we hope to see you next time.